you know, I, I want to expand the conversation here in the sense that we've been focused particularly on the government and the press. I want to just invite our movements to engage here. There, we, you know, we live in a moment where there is, frankly, widespread controversy about many of those aspects of, for instance, Biden's domestic policy agenda. You know, the fact that Medicare for all is not a policy that is in place and, and at least 175,000 deaths can be attributed to that in the United States alone is an object of widespread controversy and critique. Somehow all of that critique, it skips, it, it ignores this foreign policy paradigm that is emerging. It's you know, the, the, the movement among particularly young socialists in this country is one I'm very excited mm -hmm. about. And I recognize a certain myopic focus on our own experience as individuals and communities ignoring the fact that we are citizens constituents of a global empire with a reach around the world and however much young people in this country feel like they've gotten an unfair deal go to any of the countries where we have military bases or where we've been engaged in military actions and ask the people there how at liberty or how respected they feel and all i'm inviting here is is more of a feeling of international solidarity from the American left to the victims and survivors of our foreign policy. It, it should be a more central object of focus among the many critics who are rightfully and, and, and accurately criticizing Biden and Harris and the neoliberal democratic establishment for its various failings of the American people. I really hope that we can revive the movements that, for instance, under the Bush administration, were much more vocal in challenging this abusive, imperial, relentlessly uh, unhuman and inhuman foreign policy that we've maintained for 70 years. Well, well Sh Shahid, I have to say, I think that's such a profound point. And I know uh, me and my colleagues at RootsAction.org, when we're building campaigns and trying to get signatures from other organizations in the United States about foreign policy, often we're told in effect, well, we focus on the United States as though the other 95% of the people on the planet are you know, very secondary, or we're concerned with people of color as though those who are being attacked with drones in the Middle East or in Asia are not people of color. And it's a sort of a uh, approach that frankly, corporate media love because they don't want to talk about class. They don't want to talk about militarism. They like to talk, albeit in a very limited way, about race. It's woke nationalism. You know, to, to, to uh, follow up on the points that Shahid and Norm made, um, Black Lives Matter, which really, which started in, in uh, 2014 and now really uh, resulted in the largest mass protests in the history of this country, the uh, mass uprisings in the wake of the torture and killing of George Floyd. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has made connections with and created solidarity with the struggle of the Palestinian people. And, and president after president, including Biden now, uh, you know, reaching kind of a zenith under Trump, but Biden continuing that policy of uncritically deferring to Israel's human rights violations against the Palestinians um, is, is something that we really need to be talking about and not shying away from. And the uh, withholding of the COVID vaccine, Israel's, Israel vaccinated its population, wonderful, and then withheld the vaccine from the Palestinians. The way I read the Genocide Convention, that meets the definition of genocide. Um, and, and, and it's really cause for concern and it's something people don't like to talk about and they confuse anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which are two very different things. There is anti-Semitism, it should be fought wherever it is. But the Zionism, which feeds this, um, th these human rights violations by Israel against the Palestinians and is enabled by the US government because it couldn't happen without the US military assistance, um, more military assistance we give to, to Israel than any other country. And this is something that the Black Lives Matter people see, they understand the connections uh, between the, the protest against white supremacy in this country and the violation of the rights of Palestinians. And, uh, and that's, that's a welcome development. 
Well, that understanding needs to be widened and deepened. Certainly it's, you know, I think of what he Guthrie said, any damn fool can be complicated. Sometimes you have to be very clear and simple. We need a single standard of human rights. When you have a single standard of human rights, you're going to condemn the Israeli government for how they're treating Palestinians. And you, you similarly condemn the Saudi government for how it treats its citizens or women or journalists, right? And I, I often uh, hear the concerns around the Israeli occupation, military occupation of Palestine being reduced to religious tension. And that's another sort of, you know, red herring mm -hmm. where, you know, Jews and Muslims have been uh, very close for a millennium, for a thousand years. And what we see in the military occupation of Palestine is much more effectively a land grab and the continuing legacy of British colonialism. Uh, and and to, to, to claim it as a religious tension does the conflict and the occupation and the people there a profound disservice. I've talked to any number of, of Christian Palestinians who share the experience of having been shot at by Israeli settlers. Uh, you know, it, the resources, ultimately a class perspective, if you want to you know, apply that term here, much, uh, it explains the history there much more clearly than the sort of uh, religious overlay that corporate media have attempted to, um, to use as a lens to explain a, a conflict and a controversy that frankly don't fit that lens at all. If I may ask a question, maybe of Marjorie or Norman or anybody else for, for that matter, you'd mentioned Marjorie that the, uh, uh, the U.S. foreign policy might meet the definition of genocide with respect to the Israeli occupation. And I'm thinking particularly in the context of the intellectual property um, discussions over the COVID vaccines, and you know our government has declined to to allow vaccines to more quickly enter the public domain so that they could be manufactured in the global south and you know, better meet the needs of a population not just here in the United States but around the world struggling with this pandemic. And it, it does seem to me that that also is a, a decision that we might characterize in similar terms. I'm curious if you have any views about, about that and the denial of, of, of access to the intellectual property of some corporations that are constraining the availability of life-saving medicine to billions of people around the planet. Yes, I think that's a factor. And of course, that has to do with racial capitalism, which has been a scourge in this country and uh, for years and generations and now is is uh, really intensifying. But by withholding the vaccine from the Palestinians and then Israel saying, well, um, they're supposed to take care of their own health needs. Um, it, it totally belies the duties of an occupying power under the Geneva Conventions, which is pr to protect the health and safety of the occupied. And uh, Israel is occupying the Palestinian territories. But by withholding this vaccine, um, that is intended in whole or in part to wipe out a, uh, a people, a racial minority, and, uh, and that's what's happening here. Um, and uh, and I think it's it's very very alarming. Gaza is uh, is such a densely populated area. It's uh, the largest open air prison in the world. It's been called, and uh, and yet Israel has it tightly. There's a siege. They don't let they they control all the ingress and egress, uh, including what kinds of medical um, well the the COVID vaccine and other uh, medical help. Um, get into Palestine. And of course, the U.S. isn't protesting it, just uh, turning its head the other way uncritically. Uh, I think during the Obama administration, Obama said at one point um, he had the gall and the nerve and the temerity as he left office to um, abstain from a resolution uh, condemning Israel for building the illegal settlements and uh, and you know, as he was leaving office. But other than that, um, gave it a lick and a promise, hardly ever. Uh, well, you, you saw almost no criticism of the policies of the Israeli government. And that certainly held true uh, with Trump, who <coughs> recognized Jerusalem as the capital and, and uh, did a number of other things which are, uh, you know, which, which were very, very damaging. And I have no reason to believe that Biden is going to uh, to really be any different in terms of the uncritical support um, that the U.S. gives to Israel. And really quickly, anyone who thinks that uh, criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic should look at B'Tselem, uh, the human rights organization uh, in Israel uh, right. that's doing a lot of documenting 
of uh, I want to just say one violations. Right. I, I'm sorry. I want to say one other thing. And there is there is a collection that came out about I think it was over between a year and two, and two years ago. Um, and it's called um, Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism. It's a collection of essays. I actually have an essay in there. And Carolyn Karcher is the editor. And it's um, rabbis, students, activists, um, Israelis, uh, you know, people from all walks of life talking about the difference between anti anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Zionism. And I think it's very important to keep those two things separate because whenever someone criticizes Israel, um, especially in the corporate media, the New York Times is, you know, is the king of this. Um, oh, you're, you're being anti-Semitic and it is not anti-Semitic to criticize the Israeli government and the Zionist policies. That's not anti-Semitic. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.